Hi, all. Uh, welcome. Uh, this is Louis Gutierrez. I'm the uh, administrator for the Emeriti Faculty Board, and uh, we'd like to welcome you to the Emeriti Talk, Lunchtime Talks. Um, just a few housekeeping rules. We will uh, be taking questions at the end of the event. Um, just use the chat button or the Q&A button. Thanks. And I'm going to uh, introduce Bill Wara. He is our uh, president of the Emeriti Board. Thank you, Lewis. Um, we're obviously um, overcoming our glitches with Zoom. I think we need a few kindergarten kids to help us. It's a pleasure today to, to welcome you to the Emeriti Association's um, lunchtime lecture series. We have an outstanding lecturer today, and I hope all of you will uh, think about continuing to be members of the organization. It looks like we have over 50 um, participants today, which is actually a, a much bigger uh, population than we normally get for our in-person lectures. And I think in the future, all of our lectures, even when we're in person, will be Zoom so that people outside the San Francisco local area can Zoom in and hear these outstanding speakers. Um, any of you who have suggestions about other speakers, please uh, send us an email and we'll certainly consider them in the future. Today's lecture is Dr. Carol Estes, a pioneer and public sociologist on the political, political economy of aging. Uh, as you probably know, Carol Estes is a professor emeriti of sociology at UCSF. She founded and directed the Campus-Wide Institute for Health and Aging, chaired the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences in the School of Nursing. She's a member of the Institute of Medicine, the National Academy of Sciences, past president of the Gerontology Society of America, and she's the recent recipient of the 2019-2020 Constantine Panews Zio Distinguished Emeriti Award, which is given um, through UCLA. So again, welcome, Dr. Estes. It's a pleasure to have you, and we look forward to your outstanding lecture and then the questions that will follow. Thank you. Am I am I on? <laughs> you are on. Can you hear? Can you hear me? Okay, so we're we're uh, start my video. Okay, um, my talk today is uh, an honor and a, a privilege of my many decades in the University of California, uh, speaking as a, a graduate student in the doctoral program at UC Berkeley at. at uh, after I graduated from Stanford University. I'm a California girl now, although I was born and raised in Texas. Uh, my experience has been in policy shops where I got policy chops. And that policy chops have come from uh, my work at UC San Francisco and my work with UCLA Survey Research Center and with graduate students from the University of uh, California at Berkeley in social welfare and some in um, public health and public policy, as well as uh, a very important stint at Brandeis University where Howard Freeman was director and was creating a policy shop uh, in the, called the Heller School for Advanced Studies in Social Welfare. 
I uh, learned a great deal from him and he was an amazing mentor who uh, helped me learn how to write uh, policy proposals and uh, would fly jet to Washington. I don't know if there were jets in, but and uh, bring back money, <laughs> basically, uh, round trip. And he was uh, really an inspiration who uh, mentored me in many, many ways. And he would say to me, Carol, the boys can do it. You can do it too. And that was very uh, formative for me since I never had a, a male faculty member anywhere in my uh education, not my bachelor's at Stanford. Uh, excuse me, I never had a female faculty member in my bachelor's at Stanford, uh, my uh, master's and doctoral degrees in the various campuses. So uh, it was uh, a great privilege when I came to the University of California, San Francisco uh, with Greta Stiles, who was then the Dean of Nursing, who put a lot of faith in me. And I'm so grateful to Dean Catherine Gillis, who has at, at present is uh, the Dean for the School of Nursing. And also I want to uh, acknowledge gratitude to my uh, department chair, Janet Shim, and I say my department chair, even though I'm emerita, and, and to the Institute Director, Wendy Max, and to my collaborators, uh, my closest collaborators. I also want to dedicate this to my daughter, Dusky Estes, uh, who is a celebrity chef and uh, a policy wonk uh, in, with regard to hunger and um, food issues and sustainability in farming. and farming. Uh, also dedicate this to my two granddaughters, uh, one of whom is in nursing school now, Bridie, and uh, this, the granddaughter, Kenzie McKenzie, is uh, now in her senior year and looking forward to going uh, to college next year. So uh, I also am so blessed that there are uh, organizations that have given me opportunities and training and so forth. But I, two I specifically uh, want to mention are the uh, National Academy of Social Insurance and uh, the national, the foundation of the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare. And also uh, Kate Villers of the uh, community catalyst who has been a mentor as well. So I think we are about ready to uh, start it in the sense that um, there is much uh, that I owe to the fact that I was involved in three uh, major uh, segments of my career, which immersed me in policy and uh, resistance politics and uh, the politics and economics and cultural waves of the time, including the 1960s when I was at Brandeis and was involved in, um, got caught up in the whole uh, Michigas there, or zeitgeist, I guess, of uh, the civil rights uh, marches, the uh, Vietnam uh, War protests, and I, I found myself, uh, and of course the women's movement, uh, and I found myself marching in front of federal courthouses where my dad was a federal judge uh, in Texas, but I certainly did not disclose my <laughs> activities in that regard, but they were formative and have been formative in carrying me forward. And since then, I had a major opportunity during the George, uh, well, during the Reagan period uh, with uh, a major set of uh, 
challenges to the role of government and whether uh, government had any role uh, given that the market could do things uh, uh, and wanted to take on more of government responsibility. So it was a whole period of austerity politics and uh, uh, what I have come to call a legitimation crisis for government. Uh, which has, is a theme of this whole session today. Um, and it was something that uh, then was followed with uh, my working career with an immersion in the front lines of applied social science when I came to uh, University of California, San Francisco, and so many opportunities have opened up. Um, all right, so I let's go to the uh, song that opens us up. Whoops. <laughs> well, hey, there we go. God um, helping to give me. I want to build something that's going to outlive me. What do you want, girl? What do you want, girl? If you stand for nothing, girl, what do you fall for? I, I want to be in the room. Where it happens, the room where it happens. I want to be in the room where it happens, the room where it happens. I want to be in the room where it happens, the room where it happens. I want to be in the room where it happens. Close your eyes. They want to lead us to save the day. We don't get a say in what they trade away. We dream of a brand new start. But we dream in the dark for the most part. Dark as a tomb where it happens. I've got to be in the room. Tales in Power. All right, ready? <laughs> the first slide is a cover of the book and the, the latest uh, writing that I have uh, produced and as part of my emerita uh, career. I am pleased to uh, introduce the whole idea of emancipatory science and emancipatory sciences. And as we hear so much these days of uh, crisis uh, with uh, the Black Lives Matter, with the uh, police violence, with the uh, amazing uh, demonstrations that have taken place and of course uh, the women's issues that are come to the forefront. All of this with regard to uh, COVID-19. This book is perfect for COVID-19. And I do want to acknowledge my collaborator, Nicholas DiCarlo, and uh, a collaborator for the very invaluable ex teaching and learning appendices, uh, who is uh, Jarman Ye. And I think they are both on the line somewhere. Um, all right, next slide. So the political economy of aging uh, deals with topics of uh, crisis. So I've really started the political economy of aging work uh, on crisis and I'm very familiar with crisis and it's a perfect time uh, to examine crisis because that's what we're in the middle of. People talk about three or four different crises and even the legitimacy of, of government. There's a deep literature on crises of the state, of uh, crises uh, of outrage, of uh, crises of social justice. And uh, 
all sorts of things that speak to power and uh, the legacy of at least three decades of austerity po politics and uh, the rise of precarity, the gig economy, the, the uh, uh, having to have two and three jobs in order to make it in our society, the uncertainty, the risk. So uh, this focuses on uh, the state and, and capital, capitalism and uh, the medical industrial complex. And now I'm talking about the COVID-19 industrial complex and it is a, a great moment as we know that our own campus and the, the uh, sciences here have been uh, on uh, self-isolation uh, and on computers most of the time. Uh, even the graduate training in uh, some of the biological and genetic sciences. So the COVID-19 industrial complex uh, also, of course, involves uh, the, the competition that's ongoing uh, for finding uh, a cure or uh, ways to ameliorate uh, the COVID-19 issues. Uh, but also it brings up all the politics uh, around what has happened with the Centers for Disease Control and what's happened with the Department of Health and Human Services and uh, with uh, Dr. Fauci and um, the lead uh, NIH uh, person of uh, expertise and note. Inequality is a key element of all of uh, my work and the racial health and wealth disparities, the impression of women and of vulnerable populations, it will come through. And the whole idea of statelessness, there are something like 10 million people wandering the country, the country wandering the world, including trying to, to gain access to our own nation who are, who are without nation state status and uh, have lost the right to rights and the social movements and resistance politics and policy that are part of that is uh, very much what my work is about. Next. Um, and let, let's talk a little bit about inequality, um, which I need to credit uh, Dale Danifer and uh, many scholars who've been working on Angela O'Rand and many others on uh, cumulative advantage and disadvantage. Uh, we now know uh, really unquestionably that a lifetime of risks and benefits uh, accumulate uh, across time and uh, aging is no exception. Inequality actually grows with aging and this uh, is an opportunity for us to uh, do social change and structural change to address the, the health and economic effects of the inequality that grows. We'll talk a little more about that. So uh, targeting the macro and meso, which are the institutional level social processes and policy structures, as early in, as in life as possible. And of course, uh, Liz Blackburn has, uh, with her work on telomeres, has uh, demonstrated an, uh, the importance of early life interventions as possible, as have the cumulative advantage disadvantage uh, theorists. And the, the links are between education, income, wealth, health, and life expectancy. These are validated beyond refutation. Let's change. New slide. Whoops. Sorry. Um, I will. The social security is uh, a major element of our economic stability. And I'm very uh, 
pleased to have worked with uh, Peter Arno uh, on assessment of Social Security and how it is uh, an economic stabilizer. And what do we mean by that? It is an ec economic stimulus that uh, provides, um, there's a trillion dollars, $1.9 trillion were spent in uh, 2019. And um, it was something that uh, is obviously nationwide every year. And we utilized methodologies uh, to assess what was the economic stimulus to state and local governments. There is a multiplier effect because uh, social security checks are cashed uh, immediately and go to the dry cleaners, ha ha, uh, go to the, certainly to the supermarket to, to rent, to uh, all sorts of uh, expenses that we have every, including uh, our, our homes, our cars, our uh, various things that enable us to live. And also uh, a lot of it goes to the medical industrial complex uh, through to pay into Medicare. So the uh, stimulus uh, uh, is uh, a major stabilizer of 1.9 trillion. Uh, and I have two more slides, but before we leave here, I do want to say that uh, the Nobel Prize winner Stieglitz and uh, uh, Kathy Richards in the New York Times had a specific uh, argument in um, the, the, uh, the September 6th issue, which speaks to the importance of uh, progressive thinking progressively about taxation and how the people who uh, earn two hundred thousand dollars and uh, or more a year uh, two-thirds of them have not been affected by uh, job loss and wealth loss and in fact for many of them the wealth has uh, gone upwards he uh, and they speak how important to, for education and uh, for state and local expenses, we need to have uh, this progressive taxation uh, considered and actually adopted. Next slide. So one of the things that uh, Peter Arno and we did was to uh, calculate uh, a, a regional social security support index. And this is shown for 2008. And uh, I hope Peter uh, will be in the uh, chat Q&A to make a comment uh, about this and say more about it. But uh, what what this shows is the darker the color, the more the, the higher the dependency uh, on social security dollars coming into state and local government. And um, it is um, de Blasio, for example, well, first, well, let me just go forward about the multiplier effect. In, in California uh, this last year, 219 year, for that year, 97 billion, uh, came into the state of California and the uh, general stimulus uh, big multiplier is that 220 billion was brought in. So let's go to the next slide because, and then I wanna to toggle back uh, to this side slide, but the darkest areas. So now you can see how much more there is that is dark. Uh, and let's go back to the first slide. Uh, the one right before, we'll toggle back and then toggle now to the 2013. We, we can say how, how much more uh, the social security support for state and obviously local governments 
uh, masses. So that's really where the California stabilizer uh, of ninety-seven uh, billion dollars that Social Security sends out uh, in payments to beneficiaries, uh, and then uh, a fully whopping uh, two hundred billion in general support comes forward. This is very important when we think about uh, de Blasio, uh, mayor of New York City, has talked about uh, letting go 22,000 city and county workers and how um, this is already uh, in a fiscally strapped uh, community from COVID and tax tax uh, taxes that aren't paid in. And um, Stieglitz also uh, said that the uh, multiplier goes in the negative. If we cut states' uh, uh, taxes, we actually uh, cut into uh, the general welfare. Uh, I don't mean just welfare as we think about welfare recipients. I mean the general welfare and collective well-being of our communities. And we already know that the, um, the Kaiser Family Foundation and Associated Press have found that the uh, loss of uh, public health capacity has uh, been what, what they uh, call uh, a, a uh, lost of 28% uh, of revenues to state and local government in public health at a time when <coughs> we need it drastically. All right, so let's uh, go to the next slide. Uh, me, when I was debating uh, on Capitol Hill, and in various places with representatives of the uh, of key foundations that were working toward a privatization campaign for social insurance and uh, an austerity campaign. This depicts the various reasons why uh, wildly unexpected uh, events and things can happen, uh, and some quite expected, uh, such as aging. But particularly uh, wars and uh, the uh, not only the Iraq uh, and uh, Afghanistan wars, but also our general military operations uh, the military industrial complex and so forth and our our troops uh, may be in harm's way and uh, may be actually uh, killed or disabled uh, and and or COVID uh, catching. Uh, the economic meltdown, we're quite familiar with that, with the job losses uh, and the, the economic meltdown that happened with uh, the next item, catastrophic events, 9-11. Uh, and on that occasion, within 30 days, there were 3,000 children, survivors, whose parents uh, were able to uh, be covered. Uh, and social security checks arrived then and since then there have been other kinds of uh, uh, payments to and out and about the catastrophic events and of course COVID-19 is a catastrophic event uh, and so are some of the policy changes that are challenging um, the science and uh, the uh, truth in science that are raising huge uh, concerns in the scientific community. Uh, the institutional forces of inequality we see every day uh, that, that there are demonstrations, Black Lives Matter, uh, uh, Women's Lives Matter, and uh, say her name and uh, many other 
faces uh, of inequality, ageism, sexism, racism, classism, and uh, so forth. For-profit health insurance is a big ticket item and uh, Medicare covers less than 40% uh, of uh, Medicare benefits and there's a huge role for for-profits uh, in various parts of uh, Medicare and this social security helps uh, beneficiaries pay for uh, various uh, benefits for to pay out-of-pocket costs for Medicare, including drug coverage and other uh, managed care benefits. Long-term care in women is women's work and the fact that our nation does not have a long-term care policy, we are just in, in um, the throes for at least three decades of working on caregiving and long-term care and improvements uh, that are just barely around the fringes in terms of the work that women do. And now there's much more work that women are doing. Uh, and of course, women are uh, the bulk of uh, the essential workers in the COVID situation and their situation uh, has uh, been harmed in terms of their uh, future. So that means social insurance is, is a vital and viable part of what we need uh, to maintain. Let's uh, go to the next slide. And I, I want to explore with you, uh, I think, this whole talk is about legitimacy crisis. And I've been writing about legitimacy crisis since 1979 in the Aging Enterprise uh, about the, uh, the process by which uh, the authority of an institution, person or practice uh, commands obedience it's a process by which power is not only institutionalized, but given moral grounding. Uh, and the quality of oughtness perceived by the public to inhere in a public regime. Uh, so we have many, many writers who have uh, covered and continue to cover uh, legitimacy crises and uh, Jürgen Haber Habermas is one of the most famous uh, who is part of the Frankfurt School and uh, writing about uh, state capitalism and democracy as have Klaus Off. Um, the, the crises that I have been writing about, as I say, has uh, stemmed from 1979 and uh, the crisis is, uh, has been really the, uh, uh, from my analysis as a political sociologist has been the attack on the state itself and the uh, denigration of uh, the state and the starvation of the state uh, in with regard to uh, budget uh, politics and cuts and uh, attacks on the elderly as well as attacks on veterans, attacks on every aspect of our, our uh, larger uh, body politic and, and communities. Uh, next. So um, a major piece of work that we're doing now uh, is working on precarity and trauma, which uh, recognizing that precarity is socially produced. It can be uh, constructed, deconstructed, and changed. And abjection of the old and aging persons, uh, uh, that they're not really themselves, a form of ageism where they're discounted and so forth. And there are uh, many, many studies that uh, assess and 
exemplify the effects. And there are uh, also uh, psychic and physical in injury that our whole society and loss of social angers and anchors and uh, grief and trauma. So collective trauma is also uh, an, a very important area where uh, COVID-19 economic loss, wildly unexpected events uh, are happening. And with the legitimation crisis uh, in full view, uh, we have uh, also another crisis of statistical panic where uh, the, the demographics are uh, seen as catastrophic and a, a tsunami uh, that that means we can't pay for anything, uh, which is really a uh, trade-off mentality that is not uh, not necessary. It is one that is being produced for uh, political and economic and uh, social gains of various kinds. Next slide. I want to acknowledge uh, UC in so many respects, but UCSF has had a, a brain trust of great value. Philip Lee, who was chancellor of the UCSF campus, uh, was the uh, assistant secretary for health under Lyndon Johnson and uh, brought in uh, Medicare and had the opportunity to integrate a health system absolutely uh, at one brilliant moment and much needs to be uh, cheered for what he did. He also uh, was taught me many, many things about social insurance and why it was so important to have. Uh, and he had been debating all over the country uh, about Medicare and why we needed Medicare. Uh, before it was enacted in 1965. Dorothy Rice, of course, uh, was an emerita uh, professor, at, but before that, a professor in uh, the School of Nursing and the Institute for Health and Aging, and came to us uh, after retiring from the National Center for Health Statistics. And uh, she also, uh, contributed so many ways to understanding why social insurance was important. And there's Wilbur Cohen over there, who uh, was uh, from the University of Wisconsin and who was uh, worked with uh, John Gardner, but in uh, the early stage of setting up the whole uh, social security uh, and Medicare uh, pieces. Thank you. We can go to the next slide. So I'm going to speak very briefly about uh, a project that is of the National uh, Academy of Social Insurance. And uh, as a uh, Robert Ball awardee, uh, all awardees have been asked to speak about what they think about social insurance at this po point in time. And this is going to be published uh, shortly from uh, NASI, as we call it, National Academy of Social Insurance. Uh, I wrote a piece on the proof of concept that social insurance uh, is the instantiation of a rights-based framework that seeks systemic and structural means to human dignity, equality, opportunity, and democracy. Uh, and in the, in the uh, frame of there being so many things that influence the need for social insurance and justify uh, why a uh, respectful and uh, dignified and equal opportunity society and democracy uh, would want to have this concept. So it provides continuity and stability and security of the reciprocal social compact between governments and promised guaranteed earned benefits to which we contributed across our lifetimes and generations. 
I do believe that Bill Arnone of NASI is on uh, the call, hopefully. And let's go to the next slide. I'm doing a bunch of highfalutin theory uh, work here, but it's uh, if you're involved in policy, policy making, uh, interested in social change, interested in preservation of what needs to be preserved uh, in our democratic uh, economy, um, then uh, you're interested in who makes knowledge and how knowledge uh, provides perspective and understanding, which is very much what the very substantial work in race, ethnic, uh, gender, LGBTQ, sexualities, uh, migration, and other uh, lines of work in social sciences show that social relations and our experiences set limits on what we know. And uh, so the knowledge available to power elites is partial. And there, there is a challenge to the neutrality of expert knowledge uh, in, by uh, people who are sociologists of knowledge, sociologists of science and technology, um, and work to n understand that where you stand and where you sit affects what you know. And this makes a, a great appeal to uh, expert knowledge coming from the ground as well as expert knowledge coming from uh, the sciences, which we are arguing need to be expanded towards emancipatory uh, empirical and theoretical work which is underway. Okay, next. Standpoint theory is very much uh, critical theory, critical race theory, identity studies. It's, it shows it's a continuation of what we talked about before. The production of knowledge is linked to practices of power and the social relations of which we are a part uh, and are privileged to possess at limits on what, what we know, but they also provide opportunities for us to understand special areas, uh, not just special, universal uh, areas of our uh, great land and what we need to uh, think about. So there is a, a phrase about oppression is a, an, advantage uh, from standpoint and the relations of uh, women uh, every day and every night. I'm speaking now about Sandra Harding and, and many others uh, are pieces of information that we can only uh, absolve and put into our frameworks by understanding them. And um, let's go to the next one. So uh, not surprisingly, a lot of my work has been on uh, feminist issues. And in um, 2012, um, I worked with the uh, chair of the now foundation, the president of the now foundation, National Organization of Women, and uh, the president of the Institute for Women's Policy Research, Heidi Hartman, who uh, is a MacArthur uh, awardee. And we wrote something uh, that the uh, National uh, Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare Foundation, as you see up in the top right, uh, called Breaking the Social Security Glass Ceiling. And we were uh, privileged to present it at a C-SPAN house briefing. And there we uh, are arguing for uh, strengthening social security as women's work, as well as uh, everybody's work. 
survivor benefits, caregiver credit, student benefits, benefit adequacy, all of these uh, aspects of work are now uh, in, uh, in, the, in the making in uh, various house bills and the uh, improvements to social security uh, will be on uh, the, the deck for decisions in the months coming ahead. Um, so the, the uh, women as a majority of essential workers, I mentioned that before, uh, women juggling the three roles of uh, caregiver in what we talk about as sandwich generations, but it's a multi-decker sandwich with uh, grandparents and uh, great-grandparents, grandchildren, and uh, children and spouses and uh, very uh, significant caregiving for which uh, there are zero years in social security in terms of credits uh, as any form of work unless it's paid uh, and paid into the system. So this is a huge issue. Uh, student benefits is another one that is uh, was part of social security and a very important part of it, which was abandoned uh, due to uh, our saying we couldn't afford it. Our, our president, uh, Reagan, saying we couldn't afford it. So student benefits, uh, which are also for uh, training uh, and other kinds of education for students who are on social security due to the loss uh, or dependency uh, of a survivor. And uh, the benefits were available to a, up to age 23 and those benefits were removed uh, just to high school graduation. Um, of course, we believe that those benefits should be improved uh, ab above and beyond the age 23. Benefit adequacy is how to recognize that benefits uh, are spent down as one lives uh, longer and has chronic illness and the benefits, the fact that uh, social security and poverty uh, are a common uh, event and situation uh, for most uh, of people who are uh, caregivers and who are uh, gig workers and uh, trying to put bread on the table and especially in the COVID era. Three-fourths of the poverty uh, is uh, of the poor among the elderly are female and uh, males are uh, deal with poverty and chronic illness too and it's it's uh, a, a problem for all genders uh, next slide this is about feminist economics uh, there's a huge literature on feminist economics which uh, speaks to uh, the household as a locus of economic production uh, for the traditional classical economic paradigms uh, spoke to uh, competition and uh, economic production outside of the home. Uh, and, but the feminist econo economists uh, are bring cooperation and caring uh, into, the, into the home and um, I mean into the larger economy and counting that as part of the gross national product. And power and politics uh, are adjusted to be part of, uh, on par with economics. And the economic assumptions, some of which I've talked about, uh, are part of uh, a critique of uh, feminist economists. Schneider and Shackelford uh, are one of many. There is uh, an international association of feminist economists and uh, some great 
great economists who are not necessarily uh, within the discipline only of economics, but also working on gender, race, ethnicity, and class con uh, considerations. They've also pointed out that government welfare uh, is given to business and therefore to men in, uh, in many ways and uh, caregiving to produce the next uh, generations of, of productive participants in our society is seen as uh, on par with uh, men and, and uh, what business is granted uh, in within our economics paradigms. So let's go to the next slide. I spoke uh, about statelessness and uh, in a sense, our, our own uh, immigration issues uh, and crisis around that uh, is uh, an example of uh, statelessness uh, as people are sleeping in various uh, settings uh, and uh, attempting to uh, leave one nation state and come to another or have been uh, fearful of where they were living. But it's much more than that. So uh, given what happened in the Holocaust, and given what happened in World War II, uh, Hannah Arendt, who's quoted here, speaks of the existence of a right to have rights. And there are a number of scholars who uh, are working in this area. Uh, and she says, it's very profound. Uh, the right to have rights, a right to belong to some kind of organized community may be understood only when millions of people emerged who had lost and could not regain these rights. Stateless people could see the abstract nakedness of being nothing but human was their greatest danger. The loss of home and political status became identical with expulsion from humanity altogether. I'm going to repeat part of this. Stateless people could see that the abstract nakedness of being nothing but human was their greatest danger. The loss of home and political status became identical with expulsion from humanity altogether. Next slide. So uh, a lot of my uh, work as a public scholar, public intellectual has been uh, fighting back. And a lot of what we need to credit is how important it is. The grassroots uh, have been seeded and expanding and um, there are so many uh, think tanks now which uh, have become part of understanding the role of uh, the state and various benefits, as well as uh, expanding uh, data sets uh, that are, that none of which were available when I started out with, uh, except for maybe the Medicare, some of the Medicare uh, surveys in Washington. But these have, these have been expanded greatly. And we, we need to uh, count the success experiences because the, uh, the persons and individuals and think tanks and analysts uh, working on uh, social insurance and it's, uh, what it's doing and what it's not doing and where it's working and where it's not working. Uh, have uh, helped pave the way through uh, social security works, through uh, our the NASI and the National uh, uh, 
Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare, and now, uh, and our women's uh, institutes, policy institutes to uh, just say no to uh, completely abandoning uh, social insurance as a major resource to our society and to dignity. In the meantime, there have been many modes of resistance that have uh, developed and critical intellectual frameworks, as I mentioned, of scholars and big data. And the, the <clears throat> um, mounting legitimacy crises of, of globalization, the state and democracy. And I think democracy is particularly uh, one of concern, which has uh, instigated and facilitated uh, a form of um, emancipatory politics that are unfolding. And of course, uh, alternative and activist media, uh, new media, this, these um, uh, grassroots were supposed to be waving, but I failed to <laughs> engineer that. Next slide. So the, what, is, what is different now with resistance openings and uh, that is the irrefutability as we've talked about, uh, about inequality and uh, that we uh, are getting more of it instead of less and which is dividing our nation. And uh, there is, uh, this may sound uh, uh, heretical, we are freed from partisanship in a sense because there, have, there has been so much uh, outrage and uh, people in the streets of all race, class, gender, sexualities, uh, and the, the general tumult around uh, COVID-19 as uh, a capstone of example as how we're drawing together in terms of public opinion and so forth. So uh, this is a major resistance opening is uh, being freed from partisanship and joining together across what have been fairly hard and resistant lines. Uh, and as part of this, the elite power networks are identified uh, and connected and uh, become part of the uh, infrastructure uh, with which we can engage again uh, to address the moral infrastructure in disrepair, um, which the new uh, program for uh, campaign for the poor for poverty uh, is, has decided and is clarified that our moral infrastructure is in dis despair, dis despair and disrepair. Uh, and government by and for the people is uh, a heart of our uh, resistance openings. And market and non-market forces tie us in a, inextricably in uh, a common mission. And health equity is that common mission, uh, core concept of social justice and uh, being written about and worked on in terms of uh, scientific and um, theoretical measures and conceptualization. So next slide. Sheldon Wolin is a political commentator, uh, not commentator, he's, he's a political scientist who uh, made a profound statement that is enough to uh, make some of us shudder at this point, uh, reminding us that democracy may be a momentary political experience we must hunt down fugitive moments of democracy. And those uh, moments require engagement and participation as we are facing a uh, legitimacy crisis big time in terms of our democracy 
and uh, our economy and our livelihoods and health and security. Next slide. Outrage and disinformation is um, an important element of what uh, we have been experiencing. Uh, and in the Network Society, which is Manuel Castells, uh, who was at Berkeley and is now at USC, University of Southern California, has uh, written beautifully about uh, outrage and disinformation as well as outrage and power. Free from the control of those holding institutional power, it, that we live in a network society with platforms of communication that give us digital social networks that offer the possibility of large deliberation and coordination and action. And he inveys us to do that. And, that, and his book uh, with this, uh, much of his prolific writing is Networks of Outrage and Hope uh, in 2012. So he speaks about how important networks of power around uh, uh, the state and the state pays, plays a fundamental, he calls it a default role, the default in the overall networking of power. Uh, the stable operation of the system and the reproduction of power relationships in every network ultimately depend on the coordinating and regulatory functions of the state. It is via the state that different forms of ex exercising power uh, in distinct social spheres relate uh, to the states and um, lay characteristics, the monopoly of violence, of course, and the capacity to enforce power in last resort is uh, very much the power uh, card default that the states have. Next slide. Cyber wars are a major issue uh, that concern us and uh, particularly with regard to our democracy. Um, this is uh, a internet, don't worry, we're from the internet, social media uh, effort to talk about counter power. Uh, if we attempt to change relations, counter power and switching power, the capacity to connect different networks uh, for uh, good or, or uh, not so good purposes is uh, something that we're worrying about with foreign interference in our elections and uh, democracy. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, intergenerational allies uh, are key in this whole process. And that's uh, the whole uh, gene environment work uh, is part of this. And we are all in this together. Here is a picture of me, the shorty. Uh, they're holding a don't mess with uh, grandma's social security outside of a uh, town hall for Barbara Boxer and uh, students created uh, students for social security and uh, the uh, students and faculty created concerned scientists in aging as uh, offshoots working on this. Next slide. So um, chosen family is a concept that uh, it, we're familiar with regard to the different family uh, compositions and possibilities and sister power. Of course, this is my daughter Dusky uh, in the middle and my granddaughter uh, who is 
uh, Kenzie, who's uh, going off to college next year, and my uh, stepdaughters, Phillies, uh, daughters, Amy Lee and Margie Lee, and there I am. Uh, and we have also created something called the uh, Crone Institute, which is uh, down here as uh, something that we are building uh, as part of uh, the think tank and resistance communities that are available. I do want to uh, say how important the gene environment uh, work is and the work of Liz uh, and uh, Lise Eppel, Elise Eppel, and the telomeres. And somehow that slide uh, didn't make it into the mix, but uh, nonetheless, the importance of how uh, the telomere effect uh, led the way and how uh, genomics and uh, social genomics and gene environment work is absolutely uh, crucial in terms of uh, working toward and identifying inequalities and injury uh, that are being suffered by people who have uh, less education, less resources, and less opportunities. There's a whole concept of opportunity hoarding, which came out of uh, Brookings Bipartisan Institute, uh, which really speaks to uh, what most of us on this call do uh, for our children, grandchildren, and uh, those in our circles to uh, identify and improve uh, their life chances and uh, to give them the cumulative advantages that have done so much for us. So um, thank you very much. Um, I think we're uh, ready for uh, the closure of this. Thank you. Hi, Bill. Do you want to go ahead and ask the questions? Let's see. First, I'd like to thank Dr. Estes for an outstanding lecture. I've had numerous emails and texts during the talk uh, complimenting her and, and really uh, waiting to hear it again on YouTube and when Lewis posts uh, access to it for all the current faculty and the alumni faculty. Thanks again, Dr. Estes. It was really a pleasure. And Lewis, why don't you ask the question? Okay, uh, the first one is, um, you spoke about benefits for women in formal caregivers. Are these bills provided with, these bills provide women with financial compensation and benefits. How will they figure out the many years of informal care giving to children, spouses, parents, et cetera? And this is a FAF. This, uh do I need to hit something? No, you can hear me. Yes. Uh, this is, uh, there is a uh, bill that is uh, in the in the house uh, that has been called Social Security 2100. It attempts to do some of this work around the edges. Uh, I would say that um, much more uh, of women's voices and activism uh, say her name uh, and uh, uh, women speak out need to be involved in this. Definitely Heidi Hartman's outfit, uh, the Institute for Women's Policy Research and uh, the National Women's Law Center. We are blessed with a number of uh, very important organizations. So this needs to be pressed forward for uh, the reforms. Uh, some of the presidential, one of the presidential platforms actually allocates uh, funding for uh, childcare and uh, for education, K through uh, early childhood education. 
which is seen as uh, a, a benefit enabling women to be able to keep more of the funds that they do raise uh, to keep them out of poverty. Good question, important question. So this is a uh, response from Elizabeth Blackburn. Thank you so much, Carol, for mentioning the telomere work that was initiated with my UCSF colleague, Alyssa Eppel. We are truly honored to have it referred to in the context of your enormously important work. Thank you. Oh, how nice. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> And I can't, I, I, I should say a little bit more how much uh, that uh, work has inspired uh, me and inspired scholars uh, across the board and is uh, an offers opportunity for uh, remediation and, and improvement of uh, and really points out systemic and structural issues like educational opportunities and like having uh, stress uh, in uh, early life, uh, even stress of mothers uh, with uh, preterm and, and in the womb. Uh, so, so important. Thank you, Liz, thank you. And this is from uh, John Greenspan. I wanted to say how wonderful Deb and I found the talk to be so topical and deeply relevant. Well, thank you, John Greenspan. The two of you are a force of nature and <laughs> the work you have been doing uh, for decades is so valuable and important. And I, I'm going to uh, just ask if there are any more questions. Um, I'll wait a couple of minutes for you to uh, type those in and um, I'll be happy to uh, ask Dr. Estes. Okay, well, if that is it, oh, let's see. Uh, this is from Anne Sassoon. She says, I am so grateful for being able to participate in this wonderful event from London. Thank you, Anne, for joining us. Oh, thank you. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. Uh, that, that concludes this um, event. We uh, hope to see you at our next event in February, I believe. And um, I will be, of course, sending out um, uh, an invite to that as well. So thank you. Thank you very much. What an honor. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Estes.